The saying goes that necessity is the mother of invention. Maybe you've heard that. Necessity is the mother of invention. When you're in a desperate time of need, you'll eat just about anything, right? That's maybe one extreme, surviving in the wilderness. The necessity of needing calories, needing food, will lead people, and you can hear their stories. Anytime there's a story of someone who was lost in the woods and came back, oftentimes they have some strange story about how they ate this, or they did this unthinkable thing because they had to. But it doesn't have to be quite so dramatic. Necessity is also the mother of invention in more simple ways. The things that we invent, the things that we have created or discovered, we might put it better, in this world, are usually meant to solve some practical problem. Some need drives men and women to look for a solution, to find a solution, to discover an invention. But some of us aren't satisfied with just being in necessity from time to time. We call ourselves procrastinators. Do you know these people? Procrastinators are those who have taken that saying, necessity is the mother of invention, and have made a lifestyle out of it. So students know, right, procrastinating students know that their creative juices don't really work unless they're up against a deadline. Then necessity becomes the mother of invention, and the first idea that comes into their mind is the best idea of all time. But it doesn't just happen in school. Many of us continue, and I say us because I lump myself in here, procrastinating. We put things off and we tell ourselves this is actually better because in those times when necessity presses in on me, that's when I really, you know, rise to the top. So we put off deadlines at work until the last minute and suddenly in a rush, we get the job done and it feels really good doesn't it? This is why procrastinating becomes a habit, because it feels like you're really productive. You can cram all of that time. Let's say you have two weeks to finish some project. Well, if you procrastinate long enough, you can then cram two weeks of productivity into one night. And doesn't that feel good? Instead of having that long, methodical, slow advance to reach the goal, you get it all done at once in a rush and with a lot of assistance from caffeine. But that feeling, that feeling of productivity is often nothing more than just a feeling, isn't it? That frantic rush and the sense, wow, I got two weeks worth of of work done in one night, that frantic rush when the caffeine finally wears off, We look back at our project and we say, ooh, maybe that wasn't my best work. Maybe I forgot a whole bunch of details that if I had thought it through, if I had done things at the right time, I could have seen to. Necessity may be the mother of invention, but it often produces strange children. And that feeling, that rush, that frantic sense is not the frantic life that our Lord Jesus wants you to have. Today we come to our season of Advent, and the Lord puts the season in the church for us so that we would not be spiritual procrastinators. Do not put off to the end the work that our Lord is giving you now, because he does not want you to go through life in a caffeine-fueled rush, so to speak. He does not want you to go through this world And at the last minute, suddenly say, I've got to get everything figured out. I've got to do my whole life's work now in one feverish night. We start our year this morning, our Christian year, with the end in view. We start with the goal in mind so that we would not miss it. And so that we wouldn't find ourselves on the last day or at some point in our life looking back and saying, man, I wish somebody would have told me. I wish somebody would have said somewhere along the line that I should start working now. Because the truth is, the truth is, you are not called to a frantic, frenzied kind of life. But our Lord Jesus calls us to peace. And he calls us to progress in that life. So we start here at the beginning of our Christian year with the goal in mind so that we would actually make progress. Procrastinators make progress all at once, all in a night, but they look back and they say, was that really progress? And the world around us talks a lot about progress, don't they? But see, progress assumes that there's an actual goal. 
It is not progress to simply be frantic. It is not progress to simply run around like a chicken with your head cut off. Progress, progress needs an actual goal. And so if we have the goal in mind, we can see what actually counts as true progress and what is really just a bunch of noise. We are interested in the progress that goes toward the heavenly life. We are not interested simply in progress for progress's sake. We aren't simply interested in saying that every idea that has ever come into the mind of man, even if it's a technological advance, is really progress. For us, progress is aimed at a goal, at a specific goal, life with Christ. For make no mistake, the end that we have in view is not Jesus coming into Jerusalem on a donkey, but the end that is in view for us today is the day when our Lord Jesus will come again in glory. Not in humility, not hidden any longer in the form of a servant coming to offer himself for your sins, but he will come at the end as your savior to deliver you from this present darkness and to bring in, to bring in his eternal day. So we start with that goal in mind, so that we would have a proper view of progress. Ask yourself, when you hear about progress in the world, is this progressing toward the heavenly life, or is it progressing towards some other goal? So often, what the world calls progress is not progressing towards heaven. It is not helping souls to advance towards heaven. We are interested in progress, but what we are interested in is in the progress of lives towards heaven heaven, the progress of lives being drawn closer and closer to Jesus Christ. For the day is coming when he will return and he will be all in all. And anything that did not progress towards him on that day will be seen for what it really is, just a bunch of noise, just a bunch of frenzied, frantic energy, wasted, misspent, Kind of like a bunch of college students writing term papers the night before they're due in a caffeine-induced, you know, craze. Come out of that craze this morning, dear friends. Do not be procrastinators. Have the proper goal in mind so that you might progress towards it. We hear today of this arrival of Jesus, and we hear this same reading on Palm Sunday. But we hear it today because that at that arrival of Jesus in Jerusalem gives us a preview of what the last day will be like. It will be a sudden day, but paradoxically a day that is long promised. It will be a sudden day, Jesus says throughout, and the apostles warn us throughout that the day will come like a thief in the night. It will come suddenly, but it won't be unexpected. Just as Jesus' entry into Jerusalem was sudden, and yet we heard how he prepared his disciples. Go into the city. Find this donkey. If anyone says anything to you at all, tell them that the Lord needs it. Jesus foresaw what would happen. Jesus had made preparations, and though it was sudden and unexpected to those who were there in Jerusalem to Jesus, it was long planned. And so it will be on the last day. Jesus has in view the day when he will return. He is not held back by anything other than his own will. He is patient with us now. He isn't holding out on us. He isn't holding back from us. He isn't held back by anything at all, but he is patient with us so that more would be ready for his return. That day will come suddenly, but it is a day that is promised to you. And so even though it comes suddenly, Jesus wants you to be hoping for it, for it will be a day of salvation. These things that we heard in the gospel reading happened, Matthew tells us, in order to fulfill what Zechariah said. That prophet that Matthew mentions is Zechariah. And in the book of Zechariah, we hear this great prophecy, behold, your king comes to you. And Matthew skipped over it. But I'm going to fill in for you this morning what Zechariah promised. Behold, your king comes to you with righteousness and salvation. That's why he came in the, on that day long ago. He came to accomplish your salvation. He didn't come to exact taxes. He didn't come to, you know, impose something on the people of Jerusalem. But he came to accomplish your salvation. And in the end... In the end, when he comes, he will come with salvation to be awarded. 
for what our Lord has accomplished, he applies to you now, and on the last day, he will award it to you fully. You will actually see on that last day what you hope for now. You will see sin gone. You will see death taken away, and you will see all of the devil's schemes and all of his plans thrown into the abyss. It will be a great day, a day of light, a day of salvation. And it will also be a day of praise. We hear at the beginning of our church year what is in store at the end. Our Lord Jesus will come suddenly but long promised. Our Lord Jesus will come with salvation in his hands and there will be praise surrounding him. You heard how the people were shouting, how the people who went ahead of him and who followed behind were shouting and singing his praises. And some of them got so carried away that they started taking off their clothes. They started throwing their cloaks on the ground, which maybe we can understand, right? You greet a king by covering the ground in front of him. But then there's this really weird detail, isn't there? That some people got so excited that they cut down tree branches. Why? Well, because the clothes were not enough. And in the book of Zechariah, it wasn't just prophesied that when the king came, he would come alone. But at the end of Zechariah's prophecy, it said that it will be as if the people of Israel are celebrating the Feast of Booths, which makes us all say, what? (laughs) In the Feast of Booths, the people of Israel remembered how the Lord brought them out of Egypt, and in the wilderness, he gave them new homes. They lived in huts. They lived in tents out there in the wilderness. And so once a year, in the seventh month of the year, the people were called on to leave their houses in the land and to go out and encamp in tents. They were to cut down branches and construct for themselves temporary homes. It was a way to remind the Israelites that even though they were in the land, they were not yet at the journey's end. Well, when Jesus came into Jerusalem, I think that some of those people had in mind what Zechariah prophesied. Some of them probably just got caught up in it and said, hey, cool, let's cut down tree branches and throw them in front of him. But for us, it teaches us, it shows us what our Lord Jesus comes to do. He comes to give us a home, a permanent home in this world, no longer a temporary dwelling, no longer a temporary hut, but a permanent home of praise and joy. We start at the end in our Christian year because it is time. It is time for us to stop procrastinating. St. Paul says in the epistle reading that salvation is nearer to you now than when you first believed, which is just a way of saying, look, time is advancing. We are going towards this goal. The years are not a flat circle that endlessly repeat, but we are spiraling towards our goal. So get ready. Get ready. For the day is coming when Jesus will appear, when you will see him face to face, and when he will see you as well. And how do you want him to find you? Do you want the Lord Jesus to come and find you like a college student writing a term paper the night before it's due? Do you want him to come and find you unaware, caught off guard, drinking all kinds of caffeine, trying to get the work done before the end comes? Or do you want him to come and find you prepared, ready for him? It's time for us to stop procrastinating spiritually. For our Lord Jesus does not want us to be pulling an all-nighter. He is not interested in us being frantic Christians. But he wants us to be his people, prepared, ready for him. Living not in a rush, but living a simple life of love. It is time for us to stop procrastinating. It is time for us to stop using excuses. How we'll get around to it another time. How we'll start reading those things another day. How we'll make a habit of these things some other time. For the time is at hand. The time to begin these things, the time to make progress is now. I've said this to you before, but it's worth repeating. Tomorrow is the devil's day, right? Tomorrow is the devil's day. We often do this. We put off those things that we know we should start. We put them off because we think, well, just one more time. Just one more night of sin. Just one more night of laziness. Just one more time. Tomorrow is always the devil's day. It is a day to make excuses. But today, today is the day of our Lord Jesus So stop procrastinating, dear friends. Stop procrastinating and let's go.
That's the way St. Paul talks in his epistle. He uses this wonderful verb. It's a mood of a verb called a subjunctive. It's the let's go kind of verb. Let us cast off the darkness. Let us put on the armor of life, light. Let us walk properly. And what he means when he says walk properly is not just that we walk methodically, but that word means to walk in style. That is, let your life match your clothing. You've put on the armor of light. In holy baptism, Christ Jesus has covered you with his righteousness. He has covered you with his love. So why would you live a life that doesn't match that? You know what that would be like? That would be like a soldier coming in here this morning with his full military kit on. We would all look at that soldier and think to ourselves, if we wouldn't say it to him, hey man, leave the gun at the door, take off the pack, take the body armor off, and just relax. Our Lord Jesus has clothed us with his love so that we would walk in lives of love. We aren't called to great heroic things, at least not very often. There are occasions where the Christian faith will call you to take a heroic stand. But much more often, we are called simply to walk in love, to cast off the works of darkness. And St. Paul is very clear about what those things are. Cast off sexual immorality. Cast off drunkenness. You don't need these things. They are a waste of time, and they don't look right on you. St. Paul calls us to walk properly, to walk in style. And the style that is most beloved by our Lord Jesus is to walk in love. After all, that was how he walked. That was his life. And so, as his dear Christians, let us follow in his example. Let us put him on and think the thoughts of Jesus Christ after him, walk in the way of Jesus Christ after him, and do the things of Christ just like him. The world probably won't pat you on the back for it, In fact, I know they won't, for they didn't pat him on the back. You might look out of style to everyone around you when you lead this simple life of love, but to the Lord Jesus, to the Lord Jesus, you are walking properly. To the Lord Jesus and in his sight, you are doing the very thing that brings him pleasure. So cast off the darkness, put on the armor of light, and walk in that life of love. Cast down your sins before your Lord Jesus. Let him trample them underfoot and throw your praises before him too like the people throwing down branches in front of Jesus. Cast those dark things off and put on Jesus Christ. Put on his love. Walk in that love so when he returns, you are ready to greet him. Not in frenzied, frantic procrastinating, but as one who has looked for his day, who has eagerly expected his arrival. And then, dear friends, then you will not be disappointed. To him be the glory now and always. Amen.